Welcome back to Ultra Uncovered. I'm Russell Ditsworth, joined by co-host Corinne Chalvoy. And today we have a special guest leading up to the Leadville Trail 100-mile race. We're joined by Zoe Rome. Welcome, Zoe. Yeah, stoked to be here, you guys. So let's just get right into it. I'm really interested to know what's drawing you to Leadville this year. So I ran Leadville in 2018 when I was just a little brand new baby ultra runner. It was my first hundred mile race and I had a pretty tough day and DNF'd at May Queen. And that DNF is sort of what inspired me to get connected with the coach and to start taking my running seriously. So I've always had it in my mind to come back, but I always wanted to like come back when I really felt like I'm a different athlete. And I've calculated that I've run like more than 10,000 miles since now and then. And I definitely, and now I'm 30 and not 24. Um, so I definitely do feel like a different athlete and it just feels like such an amazing celebration and like recognition of my, my like growth, not just as an athlete, but also as a, as a person. That's amazing. And, that, you know, obviously a ton of miles since then. What was your athletic background before uh, jumping into ultra running and choosing to try to do Leadville at age 24? Yeah, my athletic background was almost nothing. <laughs> I was like a I was not a, not an athlete as a younger person. I did sort of like run a little bit in in college. Like I I jogged and sort of like I worked at a run specialty store. So I got free entry to races and started, you know, doing a little bit of trail running, ran my first 50k in college, really loved it. And then I moved out to Boulder for graduate school and that really lit a fire to like become to get more involved in in ultra running and to sort of take it take it a bit more seriously. Um and I did level for the first time, like right after I graduated grad school, which was like probably not at the pinnacle of my health <laughs> as a human health and preparedness <laughs> as a human being. Um, I also worked as a backpacking guide in college. So I sort of came into trail and longer distance stuff because I liked doing longer days on feet. So and, and spending a lot of time outside. Um, but I think after, you know, and I would use trail running to get in shape for guiding. And it's sort of been a quest to become a more well-rounded athlete and focus on speed development since then. So thinking about, um, so I think we know each other pretty well, but I don't know if I know yeah. this about you. What, um, thinking about like just getting into ultras for the first time, like, did you hear about ultra running from working in the store or how did you like, I'm always just curious, kind of like how people hear about the sport. Yeah. I, I think it was from, I remember work like, you know, just being stuck behind, behind a cash register for a lot of college. And we used to subscribe to ultra running magazine. And I remember there was a particular issue that had a woman on the cover and I just remember something about that image. I was like, she looked maybe just like a little bit older than me. And I was like, oh, like, this seems great. It's just like hiking, but sped up slightly. Like I could definitely do that. And it was sort of like something just clicked in my brain of I've always been a little bit drawn towards extremity. Like when I um, was a backpacking guide, I would like compete in like long distance hiking competitions and was always trying to like be the like fastest, toughest, most capable guide that I could be. Um, and I've always just been really competitive. And what really did it for me was like, I just got a free race entry for a 50k and was like, ah, oh, what the heck? I'll, you know, the longest I've ever Give gone is like 16 miles. How hard could it be? <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and I ended up winning that race. And I was like, oh, like, this is really it was like the first time I ever felt like I might have a natural talent for something because I was not a talented at like in high school, I played volleyball and was just not that good. Um, really always wanted to be an athlete, but just never felt like I like that anyone really saw any potential in me as an athlete. I always felt like coaches overlooked me. I actually didn't make my high school cross country team. Um, so when I won that 50 K, I was like, this is awesome. Like I might have like, some real skill here. That's super interesting. And I don't know, I guess it just, yeah, speaks to the importance as I'm sure like, you know, of, uh, you know, of imagery and like 
yeah, you've seen that cover of the magazine. Like it's, it's so important. And, and yeah, I'll full circle that like now Jamil and Steep Life is, you know, has bought Ultra Running Magazine. It's going to be super exciting to see the future of that. And I know, I mean, you worked for many years as editor in chief of Trail Runner Mag. So like, I'm sure that you brought all of that into your role. Yeah. And it's like, I didn't even read the story. I didn't open the magazine. <laughs> But there was just something about it. I was like, yeah. she just looked like super cute, like was clearly having fun. Like her hair was cute. And I was like that, I think like growing up in the South, it just like hadn't clicked for me that you can be cute and feminine and also run 32 miles in the woods, you know, like, and so when those pieces really came together for me, I was like, oh, I actually see, like, I was just not used to seeing myself reflected anywhere. I was kind of a tomboy backpacking guide and I think it was like really running media that showed me like no there's like a lot of people just like you out there like you are you are not special like come on in there's like a hundred women just like you and they're all going to be your best friends in like five years yeah I mean we just saw that with the Olympics too like I loved like I was checking out everybody's nails as much as I was checking out like, yeah the, the results I'm like oh god this is so cool before I listen trail running so exactly yeah like you can be both you can yeah 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 you can express however you want um which is awesome oh, okay cool so talking a little bit more about Leadville um I know that uh your partner TJ ran the race last year um I I believe you proposed at the end of that <laughs> I race. did That's so yes cool. um, um so obviously it has a lot of like yeah I mean it, it's an it's an important phrase for you guys but did you take yeah. anything from TJ's race last year that you're thinking about this year yeah, actually, even going back to 2018, I asked, like, the second time I hung out with TJ, he paced me at Leadville. <laughs> it was, like, our second or third date, maybe, depending on how you count things, which is, that wouldn't recommend, you know, that's pretty, that's really throwing someone into the deep end to ask oh. them to pace you, yeah, ask, the, ask you to, uh, ask them to pace you up an over Hope Pass, um, but we definitely have, like, had a uh, a history of just loving going out and training on that course and sharing that course with each other. Um, last year, TJ, I think the big thing I'm taking from him is incorporating solid foods earlier on in the day. He, I think, got a little too much salt too early in the day because it was hot. And I think he got slightly off with his hydration plan. And at 10,000 feet, there's just like no margin for error on stuff like that. Um, so I've been really diligent about working with a nutritionist to dial in my hydration and nutrition plan shout out to kylie van horn yeah. of fly nutrition and doing a fluid loss test doing multiple sweat concentration tests to make sure that i like am am getting what i need in. and i think also it it it's until you see it for yourself the carnage that happens on that course is pretty unbelievable mm -hmm. um it it really eats people up and, and spits them out. And there's a lot of really dramatic slowdowns on, on the back half. And I think that that's kind of what makes it so fun to be on the ground tracking is like, it's one thing to sort of see people move up and down in like the, in the aft links when it's like in black and white, but when you're out there in person, really seeing how much people can blow up, how much people can slow down, it gives you a, an appreciation for the difficulty of the course, which on paper doesn't look that hard. Like it's not that, like it's pretty flat, very runnable with some notable exceptions. And I think that that makes it tough to train for and easy to train the wrong way for. Like you do need to have some mountain durability for Hope Pass. Like your quads got to be ready to rock. And then you also have to have hella turnover or the last 50 miles of the course is really going to suck for you. Um, so it's a really fun sort of challenge to put together in that way. And there is so much movement, particularly in the women's race late in the day. And I think that that is a really important thing to to watch and absorb is that a lot like like clockwork, a lot of people go out really hot and the day ends at Winfield or Twin Lakes for them. So, you know, talking about that a little bit, and I love how your your background isn't necessarily in running. So it's not like you've have these paces from high school or college that are like ingrained in your head of like, if I don't hit these paces, I am doing terrible. It, it's similar to me. I had like a soccer background, not like a running background. So, you know, it's nice to not have these preconceived notions. So what have been some of your key elements of training, talking about some of the speed work and some of those, some of those things as you're, um, as you were leading in? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, again, coming from, like, no athletic background, I always, like, every day is, like, the fastest I've ever been. <laughs> like, I don't That's have exciting. a lot of, yeah, <laughs> like, I don't have a lot of baggage or context from, like, a previous iter iteration of me as an athlete. Um, so it's really, like, every day I'm better and faster, which is awesome. <laughs> like, I, I truly believe my peak is probably, like, nine, ten years in my future. Um, but I've, you know, I've been working with uh, my coach, David Roche, who's also competing this year since since 2018, literally two weeks after Leadville. I met him in person and I was like, here's the thing. <laughs> I just DNF Leadville and I never want to do that again. <laughs> Please help me. Um, and he said yes, uh, because I asked him in front of a crowd of people. Pro tip. Um, <laughs> um, and. And we've we've just you know been putting in a ton of consistent work for for since since 2018, um, doing strides, doing speed work. I've also been trying to I mean you know race thing like race more 50ks to sort of work on that. Like it's not like speed speed, but running 32 miles. You know trying to like really mm -hmm. really improve not just fatigue resistance but like my ability to run well for long periods of time um and i've really learned to embrace speed work which i initially was like pretty intimidated by just because i had no background in like structured workouts and it was tough initially to not view that as a referendum on my athletic ability um because i was sort of a slow twitch athlete and it's like oh well, i could walk around all day but i didn't have super high output um but again, that has just sort of made it so that like every day I feel like I'm getting better and faster. Yeah. Well, and now, uh, you know, I know David uh, and Megan both track it in like days. They'll mention like, you're probably on like over day 2000. Oh yeah. Uh, let's <laughs> actually, let's check this out here. Let's get an exact can, number. Can get the exact number here. I'm on 2062. 2062. Oh, that's Isn't awesome. Isn't that awesome? I got, I got you. I got you. Oh, dude, I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm at 2668. Wow. Oh, my God. See, I love, like, that, I don't know, whenever I feel down on myself, just being able to think, like, I've put in over 2,000 days of work. Like, that mm -hmm. is amazing. Like, the kind of person who can do that can probably achieve a lot of things. The kind of person who can do 2,600 days, like, that's that's intimidating as hell. That's awesome. No, but I think it speaks to, you know, right? It speaks to the whole, like, sometimes we see people have these crazy performances, and then it's like, but actually there's been yeah. years of work. Right. And even we they came out of nowhere after 2000 days of training. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, I mean, I don't know the headline of like woman achieves something after a decade of consistent work, I guess is less sexy than she came out of nowhere. Yeah. Dang it. We need to make it sexy. It should be. I know we do. Consistency is sexy. Like it's the, I mean, whenever I sort of am hyping myself up or telling myself a story about like what I'm, capable of that number gives me a lot of confidence it gives me more confidence than like expecting a random performance to come out of nowhere and that rarely does happen it it usually is like all right she's on day 3000 <laughs> exactly yeah, and and in the same respect a bad day in training you can say like i've had so many good days a bad day is a blip i'm not yeah. my, i'm not my i'm not my worst day i'm i'm, I'm my best day out there yeah i think it was alexi pappas who mentioned mm -hmm. talking about like training as a sand castle and every single day is just one grain of sand and it's like you better show up and add that grain of sand to your castle but also if it's a weird grain of sand if it's barely even a grain of sand if it's a weird misshapen grain of sand or even if you miss one one grain of sand it all sort of just fades into the background when you're able to zoom out and take the whole as a, as take it as a whole yeah Oh man, Alexi Pappas. She also taught me the the rule of the, of thirds, and I use that so yeah. much. With my athletes of like a third of your days are good, a third are great, and a third are not not yeah so, not so awesome. And it's like that really helps you just rationalize the day to day and be like, yeah, that's normal, right? Yeah, and yeah. I think like the more bad days you have, and you start to realize that like likely those are sort of like an aberration rather than the norm. And even sometimes the good days are too, right? Um, something I think about a lot is when I ran Leadville for the first time, I was running with a guy who would run it like eight times. And I was like, what advice do you have? And he was like, well, if you start to feel good, 
don't worry, it'll pass. <laughs> and I actually think that that's an amazing piece of wisdom because no matter how you feel, good, bad, somewhere in between, it's transient, right? Same thing with training. Like there's good seasons, there's good days. There might be an off season and an off day and all of it's transient. And the best thing you can do is just be curious about what's on the other side of the current moment you're in. Yep. Um, totally. Okay. So a couple more specific questions about your race this year. Can you tell us a little bit about your crew, pacers, shoes? Yeah. So ooh, no. shoes, TBD. I currently am sort of looking at a, a, a quiver of either the Nike Ultraflies, the Hoka Tecton 2s, Tecton X2s, uh, maybe switching into the Hoka Mafates specifically for Hope Pass. And then potentially, if I'm feeling feisty, using the North Face Flight Vective mm. uh, Summit Pro 1. Oh, cool. If okay. we're feeling feisty on the back half. Nice, nice. <laughs> Okay. Um, my crew, so my partner TJ is coming out. My nutritionist slash BFF, Kylie Van Horn, is pacing me for the last 12 miles. My cousin, Chris Rome, is pacing me for from Outbound to May Queen. And TJ has the honor of taking me from Twin Lakes to Outbound. Pretty stoked to share that segment with him. Um, and uh sort of my crew captains are John Levitt and his partner, Kate. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped because I feel like it's just like an amazing bouquet of the most kind, loving and stoked humans on earth. And that's really the energy that I want to, I want to take into this race is like people who know me well, people who saw me the first time I ran Leadville and the amazing friends I've sort of formed along the way. And I think that I really like this crew particularly because these people have seen me on good days and they've also seen me on tough days and knowing that you can surround yourself with people who like, I don't know, I go out and win a race. They love me. I go out and DNF. They love me exactly the same amount is, is a really powerful thing. It like just, it frees you up to perform when you're just like, when you, can fully understand that that the way that people show up in your life is is truly unconditional um and it's really like that's the that i like to have like a fun playful energy and i i always race my best and compete my best when there's sort of a sense of fun and, and play at the center of what i'm doing yeah, that's like, that's great i mean that you know and leadville is one of those races where even like the places where they're going to be are going to be high energy also and i i don't know is that something that you draw on are you going to enjoy going into outward bound as a as a big group and then obviously as at twin lakes you've seen what it looks like there <laughs> It's unhinged. Yeah. I mean, going through that half mile tunnel of of tents and whatever, are, are, you know, what what are your thoughts there? I really love a little bit of both. Like, I mean, one of my favorite like all time trail running memories is I got to run like 50k with Corinne at Run Rabbit last year, and I love being able to just like connect with other women out on out on the race course. Like that is just. The, the best. And then I also do love like those really high energy moments when you're going through aid stations, you're seeing your people, you're seeing other people. Um, and I, I do get a lot of energy from that. But I think like, ultimately, the thing I've really been focused on is like the mental preparation of like, how are you going to show up when no one is watching? Mm -hmm. And that is a big thing I'm focused on is because like, it's great to get that energy from Twin Lakes. And I don't think it's that hard to be my best athletic self when there's, you know, people <laughs> trying to Instagram live every inch of the race, but I I'm really, race. yeah, exactly. I know it's like truly the influencer 100 at this point. Um, like don't even bother getting a gold coin, just become famous for selling cricket protein and you're good. And I, I'm more interested in like what, how I show up as an athlete after May Queen, you know, around Turquoise Lakes when it's in the dark, when no one's looking, when all the influencers have gone home to get their 11 hours of beauty sleep. Like, who am I in those moments when less people are watching, when there's no live stream, when no one is there to cheer for me and I have to bring all that stoke for myself? Like, I'm excited to be like my own Twin Lakes cheering section. 
yeah Th well, there will be plenty of course for there to to have you know some some empty moments and some correct. and some quiet that's solitude it's still a hundred yeah. miles that's, yes that's like 95 percent of the whole race is like that. yeah right and it's like those moments where you do have energy and people are awesome but if that's the only thing that you're there for like bro you gotta check yourself because there is plenty of time out there to self to self-destruct um in solitude yeah yeah um it might be the last year we don't see a live stream at leadville like you never know so yeah. i don't know you can enjoy the the lack of live stream yes <laughs> that is an advantage but yeah just talking a little bit to the mental prep um so I, i'm just curious about this because i think you're you continually like hone that and um, refine that it, it it appears like over you know your whole career and um i mean i remember outrun rabbit you know kind of having the you, you kind of positioned it like we're gonna start to get weird at when it gets dark and I, like i love that and i'd never heard really anybody kind of think about it like that so do you have mantras do you have kind of like things that you're gonna be i don't know like a re a, a, yeah thoughts or like yeah you're going to go in your mind that you plan to go at Leadville? Yeah, I mean, I definitely plan to get weird again. <laughs> I mean, just because like, uh, like, I am going to finish in the dark, ideally, like if, if I'm that's the that's, that's the best case scenario. Um, and that is, I wouldn't say scary. But it's like I, you know, running alone in the night at Run Rabbit was one of the most amazing and empowering experiences I've ever had, because it truly was just like mm -hmm. me out there pulling myself along and interacting with the other great athletes out on the course. And I think that that's a similar space I want to get to is just like curiosity of like, what does it feel like to like go into the into the dark to run like intentionally into the night um, is something I'm really thinking about because I think that, you know, like when I, I, as, as a, both as an athlete or as a member of the media, I spectate a lot of hundred mile races, but because I'm typically following the podium, I see people finish looking great in the daytime. And it sort of, I think early on in my career gave me a skewed image of what these things really are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is not the reality for many of us is like it, it won't be pretty. It's going to be super weird. But if I can sort of shift my expectation towards being one of curiosity, of being one of like embracing it when when shit gets gets funky, then I think that's going to be a really powerful place for for me to for me to run from. And I think that was really a mindset I, I honed at Run Rabbit was just one of like, what does it feel like to go through the night? Because I'm going to run through every inch of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned you're a member of the media. I also consider you a thought leader in our sport Ooh. and um, really, um, you know, you have a, a book with Tina Muir, uh, Becoming a Sustainable Runner. And one of the questions, a little bit off topic, but I just was curious, is there anyone in Ultra and Trail who you look up to or admire as a leader in sustainability? Mm. Um, I really think that Killian Jornet is doing a lot of really cool, interesting stuff. Um, I think that he also does a great job of shifting the conversation away from focusing on really small actions, like make sure you recycle your race bib towards like, right. actually, you do need to get politically engaged. And his, um, I actually had the honor of uh, contributing a video to the Athlete Climate Academy. You can check that out on uh, the Killian Jornet Foundation's website. But there are a lot of really great resources, and he has used his prestige and his cachet in the culture to bring, I think, a lot of unexpected people into the climate conversation. And I really admire that because not every athlete uses their um, uses their power to have these tough conversations. And he has really been focused on environmental justice, focused on political action, which are not always popular conversations to have. I know this because I try to have them a lot and it does not always go over <laughs> as smooth as butter. Um, so I, I know that that's like, you know, who the heck doesn't look up to Killian, but I really can't stress enough how amazing it is. I think particularly because he is so big in the sport and because he's such a great athlete being able to reach a lot of people who might not all like who might not already be engaged in in the climate space like look like I'm a woman that has bangs and is currently wearing overalls like I'm I feel like a lot of times I'm preaching to the choir on a lot of this 
stuff. Like I'm not reaching a ton of people who aren't already pretty eager to hear my thought leadership and Killian Jornet by nature of sort of like the shadow he casts in our industry is probably bringing a lot of folks along for the ride who, who wouldn't necessarily cast themselves as, as members in the environmental justice movement. And I think that's really powerful. And, and he didn't have to, right? Like he no. could, he could have stayed a Solomon oh, athlete yeah. and ridden off into the sunset, into his, you know, eternal career, win Sears and all for the 10th time again. And I mean, it's just like, it's insane what he's doing. And, and I, I, I I'm, I'm in the same boat. I definitely admire, you know, what he does and what he stands up for and because he doesn't have to. Yeah, he doesn't have to. And again, like, I think, you know, it's pretty easy and non-controversial to say that you promote sustainability and to, you know, show like to do all the popular things like recycle and like post on Instagram about what you're doing. But he goes so far beyond and that and really challenges people and really tries to enable people to skill up, which I appreciate. Yeah, meet, meet, meeting people where they are and then seeing what you can do from there. Exactly. Yeah. And probably gives them that much more credibility because that he doesn't have to, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. Last question is just tell us a little bit, if you would, about your goals for the race. What are you thinking about going in? Like, what would a successful year look look like for you? Yeah, I think a successful year would be one where I'm I'm competing till the very end. I think that this is going to be it's the deepest it's the deepest women's field there's ever been at this race, and I just feel really excited to be a part of that. You know, getting to be like you get to be a part of history when you're when you're running with women like this and when you're competing like this. Um, I would I think I am capable of running between 21, 22 hours, but I also think it's going to be a pretty fast year. <laughs> so my goal is to run my own race. And I think that, I, I think that I, I just, I trust that staying true to my path will put me in, in a good place later in the day, because again, there's always so much movement way late in the game um, yeah. at this, at this race, you know, it, it's, you know, at Western States, we don't see nearly the same like amount of movement, right? Like it's sort of, you know, if you want to be in the top 10, you got to be in the top 10 at the escarpment. <laughs> like there's not a ton of, there's not a ton of jockeying, but in Leadville, there is significantly more jockeying. And I think again, like the, the environmental conditions, like you're just functioning on a razor's edge for mistakes. Um, it can be really hot. It can be really cold. And there is not a ton, like the oxygen pressure is quite low. So that just add such an amazing kind of fun quirky component to this race and it's an out and back which is I also love because you get to high five a bunch of people on Hope Pass but I would really love to compete right right through the finish line yay well we we can't wait to see you out there um both Corinne and I will be on course um, I'll be at Outward Bound I will be at uh, at Twin Lakes so can't wait to see you guys come through can't wait to give uh you and TJ a high five as you're coming back and happy and doing well um in the daylight in that portion yes, so that you can hopefully. finish in the night <laughs> yes yeah so you can finish in the night and uh yeah we just we can't wait to see you out there and see what you can do Zoe yeah well that's you know it's so special to know you guys will be guys will be out there so really stoked to see you awesome good luck Zoe um congrats on your prep congrats on getting to the start line thanks ready, ready to roll and uh yeah we will be cheering let's do this let's do it <laughs>